five areas of focus in the Commonwealth Connect programs is really building policy and regulatory capacity. So things like national ICT policies would fall into this category. Modernizing education and skills development. Again, right, we've created partnerships with the likes of UNESCO and Microsoft to deliver key uh, distance learning initiatives. We've also have uh, working with Microsoft and UNESCO a project in terms of how can we teach teachers about ICT so that they in turn can actually educate the pupils that they're responsible for and how they can actually inculcate ICT into the curriculum, not only the primary, secondary, but also the tertiary uh, educational uh, uh, system. Entrepreneurship of poverty reduction and wealth creation. We have a couple of good projects that we've implemented. Uh, one is in Cameroon, whereby we've actually introduced a program whereby it's broadcasted <coughs> over the radio, directed specifically to women. And uh, the program actually provides information about how women can get into business and the various types of businesses right, that might be attracted to them. We're promoting local access and connectivity. We actually partnered with an organization called the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. And we've actually mapped all the telecommunications assets across uh, Africa. And that information will provide a really good intelligence in terms of the, the gaps that are available across Africa and the initiatives that we need to employ and implement to bridge these gaps. We also have regional networking, local content, and knowledge. Right? We have a quite a few projects along this area, especially with uh, digital content and education. We've actually implemented a program <coughs> in the Kingdom of Lesotho, in something that we call Digital Doorway. And that digital doorway provides unassisted learning to quite a few uh, students, especially small kids, in terms of how to use technology. And when I was there launching the digital doorway in, uh, this year, there was one of who died, I think he was about three years old, uh, that had no knowledge about IT. And by the time the actual official launch was actually uh, completed, this individual was on the actual digital doorway, which is a, a set of computers that has internet access that they can actually uh, access a variety of content uh, across the world. So this individual, after the uh, half an hour presentation, he was so enthralled with technology that uh, you can see the, the actual uh, impression that they got from this individual, the impact that this digital doorway will have in that community. Now, the way we do this is through the principles of sharing, learning, and improving. So when we look at ICT wealth, it's not wealth in terms of financial capacity, well, in terms of experiences, best practices, and lessons learned. Our governance structure, we have a steering <coughs> committee that is comprised of representatives from India, Malta, Mozambique, and Trinidad and Tobago. We also have a significant amount of uh, collaboration with uh, the Commonwealth agencies, the Commonwealth of Learning, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, the Commonwealth Broadcasting Corporation, the, the Commonwealth uh, Business Association, and Commonwealth IG. We also deal with the Commonwealth Foundation, Civil Society, and then there's a special appointee that was nominated by our Secretary General that is coming from Canada. We also have a strategic advisory committee that actually provides a roadmap and builds a strategy that we need to implement over the next two to three years. And we have contributors to the special fund, and this fund is dedicated to actually uh, provide financing to quite a few projects that we have on the way. And the special fund contributors are coming from India, Malta, Mozambique the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Just a quick update on what's happening in the Connect program is that uh, we have a Secretary General, recently that was appointed. His name is uh, Kamala Sharma from India. And um, with this Secretary General, he's actually indicated to me that IT, or ICT, is one of his top priorities because it's a cross-cutting item that affects all of the countries within the Commonwealth. His priorities are to increase the level of ICT penetration across the Commonwealth, develop a partnership platform portal, and leveraging the diaspora to increase the IT penetration in the countries, their home countries. And I'm sure quite a few are aware that there's a significant di diaspora that exists in the UK, in Canada, in uh, Australia, and many of the developed countries. And we need to uh, leverage the brain power that the diaspora brings <coughs> so that they can assist the countries that they're from to improve uh, the ICT sophistication in those countries. Secretary General also created a new strategic advisory committee and it's going to be chaired by Mr. Kieran Karnick of India. And Mr. Karnick brings with him a wealth of experience uh, as chairman of NASCOM. And as I indicated before, the strategic advisory committee is going to build a two to three year roadmap for Connect, develop uh, and continue to develop private sector and public sector partnerships, and find ways to accelerate the ICT wealth from the wealthy developing countries. We have a new chair for the uh, Commonwealth Connect Steering Committee. And his name is Mr. Salomon Manisa from Mozambique. And a vice chair position was created, of which Mr. Kieran Carney will occupy until uh, November 2009, when the actual chairmanship rotates. And it's quite conceivable that the continuity between the vice chair and the new chair 
the functions that we have in the portal. A digital library that provides information about all the work happening in the, in the Commonwealth. We also have a software directory that provides information and who's doing what in terms of applications. We have an area whereby we can post um, vacancies in different countries uh, so that they can get exposure into the national, international forum. We also have a variety of projects that we have on the way, and then we have a mechanism by which we can we can um, use to actually get a variety of experts from across the Commonwealth to discuss uh, issues and items that are uh, affecting all of us in the Commonwealth. And then we have a, a national ICT policy inventory, and uh, that's something that we're working on quite diligently. So this is just a quick idea in terms of 
the discussion forward. I think that would facilitate all of us. Thank you.
And uh, well, this probably belongs to, to the first program that, uh, that Tony mentioned earlier, which is building policy uh, and regulatory capacity uh, for developing countries. And then the question uh, that exists is why we need, why we need partnership? What is the, the point of any partnership? Can we do anything alone? Uh, there is an old story which some of you might know, which we commonly use in Diplo uh, to try to express how it looks like when uh, you have different perspectives. So there is an old story of uh, six blind men and elephant, uh, where every blind man is touching a part of elephant and uh, trying to guess what it is, thinking it's snake, spear, fan, tree, or so, so on, depending on the part of the ele elephant is touching. Uh, it's quite the same thing with internet governance and the ICP. You have lawyers, you have engineers, you have economists, you have social workers, different people, different professions. Everyone has their own perspective of the internet governance, what it is. Uh, and it is important to bring them together to have the full uh, picture and be able to realize that it's an elephant. Now, the problem that, uh, so this is quite the same thing. The problem that you face is how to communicate because you have different uh, sorts of people, different uh, stakeholders involved in the, in the, in the story. This is why you also need to provide a training. This is why you also need to introduce and include different stakeholders uh, in both trainings and a partnership as <coughs> such. Uh, and all of the different stakeholders that are involved in the process, whether it be internet governance as a bit more elite maybe uh, issue, or the ICT policy, which is on the local and regional level, uh, each stakeholder has their own uh, needs in a way, uh, their own uh, interests in this, uh, project. So basically, uh, what we are trying to do with uh, all the partnerships is to address different needs of different stakeholders. So basically, what, I, what my point is that the partnership is something very uh, important in this sense. As you will see later on uh, through the presentation, uh, Diplo Foundation has uh, experience and expertise in training and methodology. Commonwealth has a great network of professionals. Uh, who need assistance in, in, in training. They also have, um, to say, to put it that way, a power to organize, to, to impose such trainings to, uh, to uh, interested professionals and to organize and even fund uh, for, for, for a developing world. Uh, that is kind of symbiosis which is very needed. Now, what do we need a partnership about in this concrete uh, sense? So, internet governance is a huge building under construction. As we, we have seen, we have a lot of stakeholders involved in that. We have various different uh, layers or, or uh, uh, different uh, topics that we should discuss. So there is a, a huge need for different partnerships and different people to deal with that. And usually we go from, or uh, we start with mapping the field, when we try to explain to people, professionals from the developing world, that are uh, going to get involved into the internet governance and, and the ICT policy process, uh, to map the field. So, what are we talking about? Who is involved? Who are the actors? How do we do? How do we find solutions? Uh, if we go to what, we basically uh, outline different areas and topics, thematic areas. These are some that Diplo Foundation uses. The classification. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there are many other different uh, classifications for thematic areas. And Commonwealth, for the ICT policy, uses a different one, which is also very convenient for ICT policy. Second thing is who should be involved in the process? Who should we train? Uh, if, you, if you think about it uh, on a national level, an ICT policy level, an ICT strategic planning level, uh, all these stakeholders from the local and regional level should be involved because everyone has their stake in it and everyone has their, their perspective. Uh, it's very important when we organize the trainings, when we organize the, uh, the uh, capacity building programs, they will really involve as much as possible, not only the governments, which are definitely the key policy makers and, and stakeholders, but also the other ones from the, from the local community. When we're talking about how we should do something related to internet governance or, uh, IG, or ICT policy, we usually talk about a toolkit, which is like handy uh, tools, how you can help yourself to do uh, a better and easier work on, on uh, uh, building up, developing an ICT policy or ICT strategy. Also, how you can better understand uh, what is what into the governance is through some analogies and so on. And then we talk about the process. So, how you establish some ICT policy uh, or develop it uh, on the local regional level. 
and then you can certainly go through a, a scheme of se several um, steps in a way that we suggest. And this is something that people on the local level that are going to work on national policy and strategy have to uh, understand and work with. Uh, and if you take a, a look, you have the first part, which is understanding the issues and objectives and uh, estimating the needs. Then you have the second part, which is planning the projects and activities. Well, DIPLO has quite a good experience with the uh, thematic areas, with problems, with objectives, with needs. Combo has uh, excellent experience with the uh, project management and uh, running the programs and projects that can develop the society towards uh, reaching millennium development goals. So this is another um, good aspect of, of cooperation between DIPLO and Combo. So we can say that partnership on capacity building in IG and ICT policy is something that, that is probably good. Um, when we ask further how we can do that, uh, we should accept, assess the challenges that people face and the challenges of the, of the whole uh, process. Uh, we should bring, we should bring inter, uh, into professional communication, which means different professions, different backgrounds of people that are involved in the internet governance process. Uh, we should bring uh, different stakeholders which have their part of, of, of the picture of the other part. Uh, we have to, as we used to put it in the blog, walk the talk. If we are talking about the internet, we have to use it to, to deliver trainings, to uh, make people more aware of, of, of uh, its benefits. Uh, we have to encourage peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. With trainings, we are not talking about students, like students, or at least not only about students. We are talking about professionals uh, already involved in the IG process in their fields. So they are basically, they can learn very much from each other. And within every uh, single training that we did, we learned as much as they did from them. Um, and introduce learning by doing this is very important to, not only to teach people, to, to help them understand the issues and the process, but also to push them in the process, to make them work, to make them develop the ICT policy, to make them come to the IG, uh, IGF and discuss the issues and be active participants. Uh, the approach that we usually go through is a uh, training course, it can be online, it can be in situ, it can be blended. Uh, the policy research, which makes them research on, on specific needs of their uh, local ground and, and region. Uh, policy immersion, which puts them into the process and asks them to, to really work in, in the field. And uh, facilitating communities of practice, which basically means keeping them in touch after the trainings. They have to uh, continue exchanging the uh, updating uh, their knowledge and exchanging their info and the things they're doing. Uh, so we can conclude this part with saying that we are talking about a partnership, partnerships on capacity building in internet governance and ICT policy to deliver in the innovative trainings compared with policy practice. And then the last question is, does it work? So the Commonwealth Secretary and the Foundation uh, have done two projects in the last two or three months, if I'm not wrong. Uh, the first one was building uh, SADC capacity in IAG, which was held in Botswana in August. This was a training for the stakeholders, for different stakeholders from the South African countries uh, in Botswana on internal governance. And it was the first and initial meeting of, of our two organizations in this field. And the second one was as the next step where we extended uh, within the Commonwealth Regional okay. National ICT Strategic uh, Planning and, and Implementation Workshop in Swaziland in October, where they gathered uh, the professionals uh, from the governments, from uh, African countries, Commonwealth African countries, uh, to try to help them uh, develop a toolkit uh, how to work on ICT policy and, uh, and uh, ICT strategy and develop a strategic plan. Uh, and these are, these are the people that have been working over there, uh, they've been working very hard. Within the seven or no, it was nine days of the workshop, um, we, we will definitely share it with, with everyone very soon when we uh, compile that, uh, so that you can see how effective that is. And they are also going on with discussions and comments through the online space, uh, of Diplo Foundation. Uh, last but not least, uh, if we go on a, on, a, on a high level, not only on these trainings, but all the experiences that at least Diplo has, and of course, Commonwealth has much more, uh, is with Diplo, we have 400 trained professionals from all over the world within the four, country, uh, four years, past four years, uh, from, from different stakeholders, and they're still communicating with each other. 
this is probably the best, uh, best confirmation that such an approach works uh, and that, that definitely such a partnership can be, can be a very, very good uh, approach. And it would be very good if any one of you would be interested to join the partnership to suggest maybe you have different experiences or similar ones, maybe we can all work together in, in some of the areas or on the ICT or IG level in, in general. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I think that was a very uh, interesting uh, demonstration of how uh, a foundation like Diplo actually puts theory into practice and how best to communicate what those instances where projects actually work and, and, and how those solutions have come about and how they can be adapted in other countries, perhaps uh, picked up in that way, the spreading of best, best practice. I wonder if there are any questions. I think I saw a hand at the back. There's a, can we get a microphone? Yeah. Well, from Henry Taylor from Nominate uh, for Dr. K Registry. Amanda, thank you for a fascinating presentation which picks up many of the themes that have become familiar through the IGF discussions over the last couple of years. The different perspectives that different stakeholders bring concept of learning by doing, and the value of networks and partnerships. It also makes me um, think about the impact of the IGF in this respect, um, through the national processes that are starting to emerge, and the way that the IGF, these meetings, can act to bring people together. So just to share an example of this um, in action as learning by doing, uh, I'm sitting next to uh, Vincent and Lindy from Kenya, the Kenyan registry, and we were talking this morning around our stand about the UK IGF and the East African IGF projects uh, and how they are differently arranged. And we realised just from a brief conversation that we both have an awful lot to learn from each other's processes. For example, the East African IGF coordinated online participation in different African countries uh, before the, uh, the regional meeting took place. And that made us uh, consider our own national process in the context of perhaps a European process. So it was really just to share that example with the room and also to, to, to come back to the Commonwealth Connects report and to consider that uh, as Commonwealth countries we have a lot of depth and breadth of experience and there's a value in, in those networks and that learning by doing. Thank you. Any, uh, any other points or comments or uh, examples of, uh, such as we've just heard from, from Emily Taylor from the, from the UK? No? Okay. Um, we've got permission in the program, Tony, for, for talking about national ICT strategies and development of, of uh, toolkits um, and uh, I was wondering if you'd like to sort of talk a little bit further about that uh, Tony, if you, perhaps um, one or two success stories as well uh, thank you um, thank you Mark So as, as, uh, as Mark introduced, uh, the topic that I'm going to take you through is national ICT strategies. And 
there are, there are a couple of things that we need to understand. Why is it that we need to actually create and implement a national ICT strategy? I visited many countries over the past uh, seven months since I joined the Commonwealth Secretariat. And every country that I visited says ICT is very important. But what I've noticed is that uh, although it's important to each country, it's not given a high priority in many of the countries that I've visited. And I believe that one of the ways in which we can elevate the priority of ICT is really to build a national ICT strategy that dovetails with the development goals of each country that, uh, is, that are contemplating uh, such an initiative. It's a critical enabler for developing countries and small states to fully exploit the benefits of ICT. And many of the reports that I've seen is that there's a direct correlation between economic growth and research, development, and innovation in the ICT sector. As I indicated, uh, the ICT strategies and policies not only have to be dovetailed or congruent with national goals and strategies, but at a global level, the Millennium Development Goals. We also need to ensure, as part of your national ICT strategy, that we have a well-orchestrated manner by which large investments in ICT can be introduced into countries. We also want to ensure, as part of your national ICT strategy, that we don't create technology islands whereby the various pockets of technology we cannot interoperate because they have different uh, operating platforms. We also want to ensure that we don't create a wide technical footprint because as we all know, with wide technical footprints, it increases our operating costs and our ability to provide excellent service to the customers that we serve. What is also important in terms of internet governance is that these policies must be developed when your national ICT strategies are being formulated. At that point in time, we need to elevate the importance of IG and the policies that uh, it involves. In 2007, the actual Commonwealth Secretariat uh, conducted a research of all the Commonwealth countries that we have, the 53 countries. And we took a look at the, the actual uh, level of ICT maturity. And what we did, we classified each country into one of four categories. It can be formative, which as we indicated, these are countries that uh, have no regulatory framework. There is monopoly in the ICT industry, the ICT strategies in, in development. Then we have progressive, which is a bit better than formative, whereby, yes, we do have some legislative framework. They are in the process of finalizing their ICT strategy. And then we have the advanced and then fully mature. Right? And there are five countries in the fully mature area, which includes the UK, Canada, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. So those are the four areas that we looked at. And we're saying to ourselves, well, OK, um, what can we do with this information? And what we did, we actually categorized the countries into different regions. And as you can see, the African region really represents a microcosm of the digital divide that we face in the Commonwealth countries. We have quite a few countries in the progressive area, and we have very little amount of countries in the advanced category. So as a consequence, what we want to do with this information is we can tailor the actual intervention strategies by region, depending on where they are in the ICT maturity levels. In Asia Pacific, uh, that area, again, right, uh, is, very, um, is very advanced. We have three countries in the area that are actually in the fully mature and three in the advanced. So those are being powered by the actual Asian uh, tigers, including Singapore, Malaysia, and, um, and some of the other countries in that region. The Caribbean and Mediterranean region, I think, is the area that is, very, is poised to actually make significant gains in the level of ICT maturity. So that is the area that I think um, that we need to keep an eye on in terms of um, the level of ICT sophistication and the amount of ICT penetration that can occur. So what I said to myself, well, OK, what are we going to do with all this information? And what I realized is that there's no silver bullet in terms of bridging the digital divide. And what we need is a series of coordinated strategies that would move countries from one level of maturity to the next and eventually right, uh, reach the utopian level, which is fully mature. So what I, when, I, when I took a look at this uh, migration path, I'm saying to myself, well, what is important in moving countries from formative to progressive? And the strategy that uh, I indicated uh, on the slide says laying the foundation. And what's important to these countries who are moving from formative to progressive is that they must have developed a national ICT strategy. Right? That is the basic foundation for countries to move from formative to progressive. 
Countries who want to move from progressive to advanced. We believe that the strategy that needs to be employed would be transforming the business. And the key strategy here is re-engineering. Because as you all know, large, complex initiatives, 60% of the efficiency gains are obtained through process re-engineering. And the additional 40% would be through the introduction of automation. So before we actually can move from progressive to advanced, we need to get our processes in good order. Countries moving from advanced to fully mature, the strategy is a utopian poor strategy. And here we need to build the CIO capacity, right, to actually implement the visions and the very, very highly sophisticated um, types of initiatives, right, that these countries are contemplating. Your e-government initiatives, cloud computing, policy computing, right, using PKI as a mechanism for authentication and encryption. These sophisticated strategies are necessary and we need the leaders to actually move countries from advanced to fully mature to implement these initiatives. So what I'm going to focus on a bit more today, right, is really laying the foundation and a critical component of building national ICT strategies. We actually developed a methodology that we have employed in a variety of regions, and specifically three countries, uh, Tonga, Seychelles, and Belize. And we're now undertaking an initiative in Sierra Leone whereby we can employ this, this actual methodology. And what's important in the methodology is that we have a consistent approach that are being used by the Commonwealth countries for those countries that are developing their national ICT strategies. And the reason why the methodology is important is it creates a, a level of integration and harmonization across the Commonwealth. And in that way, I think we can make the Commonwealth a much more integrated way, or a, a much more integrated mechanism, right, in terms of how we communicate with each other. And the first item there is national ICT policies, right? We need to understand what the national goals and objectives are for that country. And we need to demonstrate how ICT can allow that country to achieve these goals and objectives through the implementation and introduction of ICT. We also need to have an e-readiness assessment. And the assessment provides information in terms of, well, what is the level of sophistication within that country, right? What are some of the gaps? What are some of the issues? What are some of the disadvantages that the countries have? And then we need to do some benchmarking. And what benchmarking is all about is we need to take a look at a, a country that um, has similar demographics of the country that is implementing or designing a national ICT strategy and use this country as a mechanism by which they can look at the best practices and some of the good things this country has that um, maybe the country who are doing the ICT strategy wants to emulate. So now we have sort of a, a utopian vision or a target area that we need to look at. We have an idea in terms of um, where the country is in level of ICT sophistication, and now we have an ICT gap. So the gap, together with the national ICT policy, will now create your national ICT strategic plan. And at this point in time, it's very important for you to know what the funding source is going to be in terms of um, implementing the actual projects that would be emanating from your national ICT strategic plan. And those are the quick wins and fast track initiatives. And one of the things that we have did successfully in the Commonwealth is actually build collaborative partnerships with many of the funding agencies, the World Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, and um, we're looking at the African Development Bank and Asian Development Bank. And the reason why this is important is that as countries are developing the national ICT strategies, we need to sensitize these organizations that funding requests will be coming from this country and also bring them in as part of that process, early, early on in the process, so that when they actually see something that is being documented and well formulated, it provides a much a very good or robust business case to these organizations to provide funding. And we can't really ignore, right, in terms of this methodology, you know, the soft issues of project implementation in terms of change management and communication management. And equally important, right, is that we need to have a very good project management posture to implement these, uh, these initiatives that would be emanating from your strategy. So basically, that's the methodology that we've employed right, successfully in three to four countries, and this is the methodology that we'll be going forward, right, in a variety of workshops that we'll be working with Diplo, right, and other organizations as we move this methodology across the Commonwealth. What I did, I took a look at uh, the 2006 World Bank study on 40 countries, and they've identified a series of national ICT policies that were mentioned by these 40 countries. 
And the number one policy is e-government, right? 95% of the countries who are polled says e-government is a very important component in terms of their national ICT policy. And of course, as we know, in e-government, it has some inter internet governance issues and policy surrounding it. Infrastructure was mentioned 90% of the time. And then e-education, right, was also mentioned 88% of the time. The most surprising one is that for e-health, only 35% of the 40 countries mentioned e-health as a national ICT policy. And I think when I dig a bit more in detail in terms of why this is, because e-health requires a substantial amount of bandwidth, and many developing countries, right, don't have that luxury of high bandwidth to move, say, video uh, streaming, when you're looking at uh, providing healthcare facilities, right, from remote to remote areas, from highly populated areas. So bandwidth is an important issue, and that's why I believe that e-health is, uh, is not uh, being mentioned uh, much more often. So those are the national ICT policies. The role of strategy that we have for this national ICT policy, again, provides a significant amount of collaboration that we need to have with organizations like Diplo, organizations like the ITU, and also we're working with the EU to implement the strategy. So we've created a methodology for designing national ICT strategies. We are delivering capacity building workshops, and we've done the African region. And uh, in early 2009, we're moving to Caribbean and also Asia Pacific. And then we, ex we insert an expert, right, uh, through the Commonwealth uh, Consultant Partnership to assist the country in each region to develop a national ICT strategy. And when we did, what we actually do with this consultant, we develop um, a capacity building workshop for a core team of individuals that then would be the champions or the evangelists for developing a national ICT strategy, right? And this we've done in Belize and Seychelles. Now the country receiving this expert will have to sign an agreement with the Commonwealth whereby if countries in that region are contemplating similar initiatives, they must provide technical assistance in terms of lessons learned and best practices. And that way we can sustain the national ICT strategy workshop and, and uh, capacity building effort in, in a regional manner. So we actually move into the country first, we provide um, a workshop for the experts or for the core individuals within that country, and then we ask that country to assist other countries in developing their own national ICT strategies, and that way we build a very sustainable model in terms of how we can continue building national ICT strategies in the region. As I indicated before, we develop partnerships to source funding, right, for the implementation of national ICT strategies. And as, as one of the visions that we have is that eventually we want to see the Commonwealth Secretariat as being a center of excellence for designing and implementing national ICT strategies. Similarly, right, for re-engineering and CIO capacity building, right, we want to develop a similar rollout strategy and eventually, right, the vision, of course, is to be the center of excellence for re-engineering and building CIO capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, for that uh, presentation, which brings the focus down to the, to the national level and to the, uh, at the local community level as well. It's very important. Uh, we're getting close to our, our time. In fact, we've gone over slightly our time allocated for this, this workshop, but uh, I think we've got the opportunity to take one or two quick questions for, for Tony or indeed for, for, for Tom and, and Vlada if you, if you want to um, bring them back into the discussion as we, as we wrap up this, uh, this workshop, this forum. So any questions? Yes, question at the back. First, the lady at the back, and then we'll come to you, madam, and then... Over here, so I've got three questions. Oh, we can't quite hear you. So. We can't quite hear you. Dalwatte from Sri Lanka. I am here as an ISOC ambassador. I work for the UGC in Sri Lanka, and I am also a Diplo um, former student and a tutor. Uh, I would like to ask from Tony. Uh, he was mentioning about uh, ICT policy for governments where you would use like um, public inf uh, uh, identification. So right now in Sri Lanka, we don't use that much of IT communication for like uh, administrative work. So is there any way where we can learn from the others or some partnership program where we could uh, really go ahead with using IT for administrative purposes? I mean, we do use email and internet, but like really to get communication speed up, we really need the paper signatures right now. So. Um, 
this is a really a bugbear in our administrative system. So I was wondering whether where I could learn any best practices for some kind of uh, examples from where we could take it forward. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for that question.